in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12. So if you would turn in your Bibles there or turn in your phone or whatever you have. Philippians chapter 1, verse starting at verse 12, we're going to go through verse 18. Uh, we all know people who can handle problems better than others, right? You know who they are. Uh, people come to mind for me, uh, the difficulties come, problems come, and they just kind of roll with the punches. They remain optimistic all the time, and they just know how to see the good side of things. It's a gift, really, that they have, and we can learn from those kind of people, actually. Uh, the Apostle Paul was a man like that. We've been studying uh, through this epistle that he has written. We're no stranger to him because we went through uh, Ephesians and he wrote that. So we know who Paul is and what kind of a man he was. We also know that he was well acquainted, acquainted with trouble. He was very acquainted with trouble. By the time he wrote this letter to the Philippians, he had been beaten many, many times. He had been stoned to death. That was their intent. Some people believe he actually did die and God raised him back from the dead. Uh, he was run out of multiple towns. He was arrested a few times already and uh, spent time in jail. His life was threatened multiple times, multiple times. He lived under the threat where people wanted to kill him. And in spite of all this, he never let any of that rob him of his spirit-given joy. Never. Not once. Throughout all of his writings. Uh, here, we see him reporting to the Philippians about how he's doing in jail. But on your outline, there's, there's something that Paul understood, and that is that, that there's things that are going to happen to him. Paul understood that, that there were things going to happen to him. And sometimes they're good things, sometimes they're bad. Sometimes they're, they're blessings, Sometimes they're very, very hurtful things that are going to happen to him. And, and Paul understood that things are going to happen to you in your life. Do you all understand that? Do you got that? Because if you don't got that, you need to get that. There are things going to happen to you in your life that you don't have any control over. Some of them you like, some of them you won't like. But they're going to happen to you. Paul also understood that things are going to hap happen to him so that things would happen in him. The things that happened to Paul, he understood that God was using that to grow him, to purge him of his sin. Paul was a sinner. To perfect him and mold him into the person that God wanted Paul to be, into the image of Jesus Christ. So there was a growth process, a sanctification process that was going on inside the man. And things happened to him so things could happen in him so things could happen through him. God wanted to use the Apostle Paul and he had to do things to him so things could happen in him so then God could do things through him. And he wanted God's desire is for us to live a life that brings praise and glory to him. Uh, some people, it takes them a long time to get it that life is not about you. It takes people a long time to get that. Uh, the quicker you get that, the more joyful you're going to be. Life is not about you. It's about God. We are to live for the praise and glory of God, not for the happiness and comfort and ease and pleasure of ourselves. And so Paul understood all these things. And here in this verse here, he's, in these verses, he's reporting to the 
Philippians because they had supported him, they had given him money, and, and he loves them, they love him, and he's reporting to them how he's doing in Rome in jail. And they want to know what's happening. And, and here in these verses, Paul reveals to us and we discover how a believer can have joy in spite of hardships and haters. Because you're going to have those two things in your life. You're going to have hardships and you're going to have haters in your life. And Paul, he had joy. Look what the Bible says. We'll just read this real quick. Romans, or Philippians 1, verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have, in other versions it says, uh, I want you to know, brothers, that what happened to me has. So my circumstances are things that have happened to him. They have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So that my imprisonment or my chains other versions say by the way that's his hardship he's in prison he's in chains in, that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorium guard and to everyone else and that most of the brethren trusted in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear so Paul's joyful about that. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. So Paul's saying some are preaching, they're encouraged by my imprisonment, and, and it's uh, my courage is helping them, and, and they're preaching. But some are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. So Paul is giving them the negative side. You know, not everybody is preaching Christ with a good motive. There are some people preaching Christ with a bad motive. And, and here's the reason. There's always going to be haters. And they are preaching that way. He says here in verse 15, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. This is happening to me. But some from goodwill the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed to the defense of the gospel. The former, the ones who are preaching through with envy and strife, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So for somehow they think that preaching Christ is going to cause Paul more distress. We don't really know all the thinking or details behind that but we know what the Bible says the reason why they were preaching Christ is they wanted it to harm Paul while he's in Ro a Roman imprisonment perhaps they thought that the more they preached Christ and the more popular Christianity became they would take it out on Paul who's in prison these people wanted distress to come they're haters that's what they are People who cause you distress want you to be distressed are hateful people. Is that true? They're haters. They're haters. They have hate in their heart. They have hate in their mind. They have hate for their motive. They're haters. And that's what they were doing to the Apostle Paul. Look what Paul says in verse 18. What then? Some... Some translations or commentaries say, Paul is saying, so what? So what? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. The Apostle Paul, here he is uh, being hated and having tremendous hardship in his life. And yet he says, I'm still going to rejoice. Now last week, I said that you can tell a lot about a person by how he prays, what he prays for. And you remember what the Apostle Paul was praying for. He was praying that the people at Philippi would grow in godliness for the praise and glory of God. That's what he prayed for. You need to ask yourself what you're praying for at night. Because you can tell a lot about a person by what they pray for. Here, 
this week we see that you can tell a lot about your spiritual maturity by what it takes to rob you of your Christian joy. You can tell a lot about your own spiritual maturity, your Christ-likeness, how you've grown in Christ, where you are in Christ, by what it takes to rob you of your Christian joy. Now the Apostle Paul is a great Christian model of a man who never wavered in his joy. He never wavered. He had a divine optimism that every Christian can have. You can have that. You're a Christian, you're a born you're a child of God. You can have, you know, Paul's Paul's not like this super Christian that attains things that you can't. You can have it too. You can live a life of divine optimism and never waver in your joy. Now, the Apostle Paul didn't pretend like bad things weren't happening. He didn't like, you know, stick his head in the sand and pretend like he wasn't in prison, pretend like he wasn't in chains, pretend like he didn't have difficulties. He didn't do that. He understood where he was, what was going on, what his problems were, uh, but he just didn't let it rob him of his joy. In spite of his hardships and in spite of haters, he had joy in the Lord. Now, I want to give you two points today. How did how did Paul maintain his joy? There's two things I want to just touch on real briefly, but I want to read my definition of joy first again. We got to remind ourselves what joy means, right? Christian joy, Christian joy is a gift from God. If you don't, if you're not saved, if you're not a child of God, you will never have Christian joy. You don't have it. You say, well, why can't I handle all of my life's problems and all of my difficulties and all that? Well, you don't have Christian joy in your life. That's why. You're not saved. You're not a Christian. Christians have Christian joy. Christian joy is a gift from God when you experience, where you experience a sense of constant well-being. And anybody in here is a believer, you understand that, that well-being. Why? Why do you have that well-being? Which keeps your heart glad regardless of your circumstances. Your heart is glad. Now, I'm not saying you're laughing and smiling and you don't ever cry and you're not walking around constantly, you know, showing a tremendous amount of enthusiasm, but inside your heart you have a sense of well-being and you're glad. You're glad. I asked somebody one time about their job. They had just got a new job. It was a very difficult job, and I said, I hope you like your job. They said, I'm thankful for my job. You know what they meant? That's the joy. That's the difference. I can be thankful for my job because I have God in my life. And that's what joy is. It's regardless of your circumstances. And here's why. Because you're right with God. You're right with God. When I say right with God, I don't mean that you're living perfect. I don't mean that you're doing everything that you're supposed to do. What I mean by that is you're saved is that God has forgiven you of your sins. You've trusted Christ as your Savior. God has forgiven you of your sins. And he, you have eternal life. You have, you have accepted from God the only way to go to heaven, and that's through Jesus. That's the only way to go. There's no other way. And you've done that, and you've bowed your knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and you said, you're the Lord. I'm yours. I believe in you. That is right with God. That doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you're right with God. It's the only way to be right with God, right? It's through Jesus. Now, the Christian joy is made full when you delight in what God delights in. So you can have joy, but it might not be full. There is a fullness of joy that comes to people who delight in the things that Delight that God delights in. 
So Paul had joy. How did he, how did he do that? There's two, two things. First of all, Paul was joyful in spite of his hardships because he had the right outlook. He had the right outlook of life. He didn't look at life like non-joyful people look at life. He didn't look at life the way depressed and discouraged and sad-hearted people look at life. Because if he did, he'd have been bummed out all the time, right? All the trouble he had. So he didn't look. His outlook of life was not the same as other people. His, his, the right, he had the right viewpoint. In the eyes of anyone else, his situation would have seemed bad. But he didn't see it that way. Look what it says here in Philippians 1. He says, now I know, now, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So, so Paul saw his imprisonment as a divine purpose. It had a divine purpose. It was for the furtherance of the gospel. He didn't focus on his chains. He didn't focus on his confinement, although both of those were happening to him. He focused on the progress of the gospel. You see his outlook? You see that? Now, guys, that is something that modern-day Christians don't do. That is something. I have to be honest. Our outlook, the, when we get up in the morning, the last thing on earth we're thinking about is, hey, how am I going to progress the gospel? Usually, we're, how am I going to progress myself? And the American dream has told us the lie that that's okay. But it's not. It's not okay. It's not the proper outlook for a child of God. It's not the proper outlook for a Christian. The Apostle Paul, he was focused on the progress of the gospel. Now that word progress means moving ahead against resistance. There is resistance. And Paul knew very well about resistance. And he knew that it was unavoidable for a person who is going to be living for God. Guys, if you're going to live for God, you might as well just mark it down. You're going to get resistance. And what I mean by resistance is people are going to be hesitant. And they're going to have a natural aversion to accepting anything you say or do. It's resistance. There's going to be a resistance. And this is what happened to the Apostle Paul. And it's unavoidable. And anyone who has ever really had a desperate desire in their heart to serve God, serve the Lord Jesus Christ, they know about resistance. And they've experienced many, many, many times in their life. Things do not go easily. They don't. For a person who's truly trying to serve God and be obedient to the Lord, and progress the gospel, there's tremendous resistance from all of the forces of hell. There is resistance from the world. and We've talked a lot about that. There's actually resistance from your own self, your own sinful flesh. And of course, there's resistance from your friends. There's resistance even in your own family. Jesus dealt with that. His family resisted him. His clo close people resisted him in the furtherance and the progress of the gospel. So that's normal for people who love Jesus. You, every day, people who love Jesus and want to serve God, they get up every single day knowing that there's going to be resistance to what they're doing. They know it. So how did the gospel progress for the Apostle Paul. He says that in verse 13, so that, in, so that my imprisonment, it's kind of funny when I read this, I mean, he's, he's talking about the progress of the gospel, but he's in prison, so he's in chains, he's locked up. He's, he's not traveling around. 
the country and the world and the nations preaching the gospel. He's in prison. He said, so that my imprisonment, this is his hardship, by the way. He's joyful in spite of hardship. My imprisonment in the cause of Christ. Now, I've got to stop there. Because he didn't see himself as a prisoner of Rome. See, a lot of times, um, what is sometimes people say, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. You know, and Paul would say, well, what are you doing under your circumstances? Why don't you get on top of your problems? Don't get under them. So Paul here, he's in prison, and, and he doesn't see his chains as uh, a problem. He doesn't see that he's a prisoner of Rome. He refuses to say that. Why? Because Paul understands that God is sovereign. And every single thing that happens to you and me in our life is ultimately they're controlled by God. And he is our father. Everything is father filtered. Did y'all know that? Everything is father filtered. So whatever is happening to you in your life had to get permission from God for it to happen. Did you know that? Everything that's happened to you. So Paul is not in prison because of Rome. Paul is in chains, imprisonment for the cause of Christ. God has put Paul in prison so he could fulfill his purpose. This is what happened to him. He's in prison, and this is the way Paul saw it. He didn't see himself in prison as Rome, but for the cause of Christ. And on your outline, I wrote, as long as Paul was there for Christ, he didn't care where, where he was. Now let that sink in. As long as Paul was there, and I mean anywhere, whatever, wherever there is, as long as you're there for Christ, he didn't care where he was. See, here's the problem with us today. We're not, most of the places we go are not for Christ. They're for ourself. And it really lessens our life. Our lives, many times our lives are extremely shallow. Sh very shallow. I would say that most Christians, their your life is very, very shallow. You're not really living for God at the deepest level that God wants you to live. And here, Paul is saying, I don't really care where I am. Jail, so that's fine with me, as long as I'm there for Jesus Christ. And this is the way his outlook always was. He always saw things like that. I'm in prison, so what? He says, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorium guard. That's the palace that's the palace guard to Caesar. All, and to everyone else, he says here. So, so Paul, Paul is being held in prison. He, Paul is a high-level prisoner. He's famous. People know who he is. You know, he did many, many miracles, and people knew it. Verifiable miracles. And so they knew who he was. And that he was well known throughout all of, through Europe, Turkey, through uh, obviously the Middle East. And he's a high level prisoner, but he's being held, because he's a high level prisoner, he is being held by the highest level guards in the entire Roman Empire. These are the top guys, the highest level the praetorium guard, and these are men that guarded Caesar, his palace, and they're the ones who was given the job to keep peace in Rome. And over the course of two years, so Paul's in there in this jail, this confinement for two years. So over the course of two years, Paul had probably had dozens and dozens of guards that were chained to him because 
he had to have these guards chained to him 24-7. Paul had no privacy. Talking about hardship. No privacy. 24 hours a day. They came in four-hour shifts, and they would. it's about an 18-inch chain. They're tied to him, so where, when he slept, when he ate, when he talked to other people, when he was writing, whatever he was doing, there was a Roman guard 18 inches away from him. No privacy whatsoever. Talk about hardship. How many of you like your alone time? How many of you like that? You like to kind of get alone? Yeah, that's a hardship. That's a hardship if you didn't get to, wouldn't it? Paul didn't have that. He didn't have that. For two years, but you know, Paul, he, he didn't think of it as him being in jail. He thought, man, these guys, I have a captive audience here. These guys are chained to me and they can't get away. And, and, and in God's great plan, Paul was able to share Christ to the most elite and influential. And I want that word to your imagination to go with that, that influential. These men were extremely influential. And their influence was over thousands of young soldiers. Thousands and thousands. Each one of these men had that kind of influence. And in God's great plan, Paul was able to share Christ to the most elite and influential soldiers in all of Rome. The Bible says so that Paul, this is how Paul looked at it, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorium guard and to everyone else. Now when he says here that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known, what does that mean? What does he mean by that? Well, what it means is, is that Paul was in prison for two years, but it wasn't long, my friend. It wasn't long. After anybody who spent time with the Apostle Paul, they didn't start to realize who he was. This is not just some prisoner. And they started to spend time with him and see how he interacted with him. And we know how he interacted with him because we've got his heart in all of his letters. And we know his behavior and his conduct. We know it. So they started to interact with this man, and they begin to realize this is an amazing man. This man is gracious. He's kind. He's patient. He's wise. He has deep convictions. Uh, he has perseverance even in the most difficult hardships of life. He actually loves us. Genuinely, although we are his guards, we're the people who put him in jail, but he cares about us. So it didn't take long for any one of those guards or anybody that hung around Paul to realize that he was not there in jail because he committed a crime. He didn't do anything wrong. He was in jail. He was in prison for one reason and one reason only. And that's for preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he was there. Now we don't know how many guards got saved. We don't know that. But we definitely know some were. Because at the end of this letter in Philippians chapter 4 verse 22 the Apostle Paul says, all the saints greet you. He's writing to Philippians. He says, all the saints here greet you. And he's talking about from Rome. And he says, especially those of Caesar's household. People were getting saved in Caesar's household. And the household didn't just mean Caesar's family. It also meant all of his slaves. Anybody that was in that house all the time and were taken care of by Caesar. And guys, if Paul would not have gone through these hardships, he would never have been able to witness to these elite soldiers and have the impact that he had at such a high level 
And again, as I said earlier, these soldiers, the Praetorium Guard, are the elite soldiers in Caesar's military. These are the men that were chosen by Caesar whenever he wanted to do a campaign and go and take over other lands and things like that. He would put these generals in charge of that. These, these guards would be elevated to general position and they would go out and there is no doubt that these guards, we know that Christianity spread quickly the first century. There's no doubt these guards went out and said, as these young men were about to go into battle, some of these guards had to say, I want to tell you about a man named Paul that I met in prison who told me about another man named Jesus Christ who when you believe in him, you can have eternal life. So if you're afraid to die, you don't have to. And there's been historians who say that these kind of things happen with these generals in the Roman military. So Paul had an impact while he was sitting there in prison, a great impact. By the way, you never know if you win one person to the Lord what that one person's going to do. You never know. They could win thousands and thousands. So Paul had the right outlook. Write this down. Well, maybe you don't have to write it down. It's on the outline. What you see as life's disappointment may be in truth his appointment. What you see as life's disappointment may be, in truth, God's appointment for you. Guys, God is always working. He never stops working. And just because it's unpleasant does not mean it's not from God. Doesn't mean that. And that's how Paul saw it. And Paul was joyful in his hardships. Because he had the right outlook. He had the right viewpoint. He saw the gospel was progressing. And he said, well, you know, I'll suffer. I don't care. I'll suffer. I'll suffer hardship. As long as what God wants to happen is happening. And I'll go through all of the hardship. I'll go all through all the difficulty. And I'm not even going to lose my joy when I do it. Because I'm doing it for him. Second thing. As Paul was joyful in spite of haters because he only cared about the right outcome. He cared about the right outcome. What's the result? Oh, okay, these people hate me, but is the result good? Is the result for the glory of God? He didn't care how people felt about him. He didn't care. And I, I guess I need to preface that with the fact that he didn't purposely do things to make people hate him. He wasn't rude or, um, you know, mean-spirited. He didn't attack people unless they, he, he did defend the gospel, but he didn't attack people. He, he was a nice man. So the people who hated him was because they were hateful people. Look what it says here. It says here in, in that most of the brethren trusted in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fears. And this is what made Paul joyful. He was happy about this. Uh, look, when, when you witness without fear of the hardships, it encourages other people to do that too. You know, when you're not afraid and you witness, and you don't care if people don't like you, you don't care what's going to happen, and you witness, it makes other people, it encourages other people to do it because courage is contagious. And your strength becomes their strength. And this is what Paul was happy about. That was the outcome, and Paul was glad about it. He says in verse 15, 
Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. So Paul is saying, I'm not, I'm not pretending like everything is perfect. You know, he's reporting to the Philippians, and he says, I'm in jail. The gospel is progressing. Uh, some people are preaching courageously for Jesus. But he doesn't want to pretend like there aren't some negative things happening, because there are. You never want to pretend like that, by the way. Life is not all happy. Life is not all great. There are trouble. There are problems, right? There are. And everything, and this is on your outline, everything and everybody being perfect is not required for the joyful Christian life. You know, if I had to depend on everything going perfectly and everybody being perfect for me to be joyful, believe me, I'd be miserable all the time. And so would you. Right? And so would Rachel. She can't, she can't get me to be perfect. She's been working on that for 32 years, and I'm still not perfect. And, and, um, but she still has joy. Why? Because she doesn't expect everything and everybody to be perfect, to have joy. If you expect that, you'll never have joy. You'll never have happiness. You'll be a, a sad, depressed person your whole life. Philippians 1.15 says, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. So that is happening. They were preaching the true gospel, though. They were preaching the truth. Paul's not saying they're preaching a false gospel. He's saying they're preaching a, a true gospel. So they're, 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 their message is right. But they're doing it with ungodly motives. And by the way, that happens all the time. People say the right things, but in their heart is extreme wickedness going on. They say all the right things, but they do it all from the wrong motives. And here he, he mentions two here, uh, envy. These are haters of the Apostle Paul. They had envy. Now, what is envy? Envy is when you have a resentment that someone else has something good, but you don't have it. That's what envy is. It's when you, you have resentment in your heart towards someone else who has something good, but you don't have it. So you get envious towards somebody. Jealousy is when you have it and you're afraid somebody's going to take it. That's what jealousy is. Envy is when they have it and you don't like the fact that they have it. You actually want what they have. So you have resentment toward them. And that's what these men were. They, they were preachers of the gospel, uh, but they were not an apostle. No, no, they were not an apostle. They did not have what Paul had. Paul had a calling from God that none of those other men had. He was special. By the way, there's a lot of fake, false people that are trying to call themselves apostles today. Please don't pay attention to those people. They're not. They're almost in the line with this. Who knows? They might be preaching the true gospel, but they're doing it from the wrong motive. They're, they want something that's not theirs. The Apostle Paul had the authority of God. He had a heart for God. He, he had convictions. He had a calling. And, and also many of the church, they loved him. The Christians loved Paul. They knew who he was. And these other preachers, they didn't like that. They didn't like that. They saw Paul as a threat. Why? Because they're self-centered people and they want all of the glory and they want the limelight and they're very ambitious people and no matter how hard they try, they could not become like Paul. So they had envy. And they didn't preach Christ out of love. They really preached Christ so they could become prominent and in Christianity. And they also had strife, he says, envy and strife. Uh, the conflict, this is conflict in their heart. They had a conflict in their heart 
toward Paul because they have this spirit of um, competition. That's what the word really means. It's, it's just this idea that we're striving and we're competitive toward one another. And they wanted to be more famous than Paul. That's basically what is happening here. So they hated him. They hated Paul. By the way, I want to say something to you. Your friends are people who are happy for you when good things happen to you. That's your friends. Your friend, Paul's friends were glad he was an apostle, were glad that God blessed him so much, was glad for Paul that he got the revelation that he got and the authority and the ability to do miracles. They were happy for Paul. Your friends are happy when good things happen to you and when God blesses you. Your enemies, haters, uh, they're envious. And they don't want you to have it. They don't want you to have it. And maybe you've run into people like that before. He says here in Philippians 1, 15, but some also from goodwill, and the latter do it out of love. So he brings up that good positive aspect. You know, there are good people. Thank the Lord for them. They have a different motive. By the way, love always wants what's best for others. Love always wants what's best for others. If you're, if you're trying to tell somebody you love them and you're not doing what's best for them, then you don't love them. Love always wants what's best for others. He says, but some also from goodwill, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Now, that's what Paul cared about, the defense of the gospel. That's what his friends cared about, that were preaching properly, the defense of the gospel. The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motive. Selfish ambition on your outline is just looking out uh, for yourself only. Selfish ambition, looking out for yourself only regardless of the impact of, on others. And you know what that is. This is the corporate people. These are corporate people. You know, there's preachers, by the way, today that they look at being a pastor as, as a job, and they look at it as a career. So they go to this church, and they do, you know, they do, you know, they have some kind of success at that church. So then they put their resumes out, and, and they go to a little bit bigger church. And then they put their resumes out, and then they go to a little bit bigger church than that. And that's their that is what they are thinking of from the moment they leave seminary. It's a career to them. And many of them do very well doing that. That's what Paul's talking about here. They don't really care about people. They care about themselves and they'll do whatever they have to do in order to stay on top. So they have selfish ambition. These are the, the preachers. They're preaching Christ. They are preaching the true gospel. It's just their motives are wrong. Paul says in Philippians 1, 17, 18, he says, they're thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Again, we don't really know exactly how they were supposed to cause him distress and imprisonment. Uh, maybe it was they thought it would bother Paul that they're out there taking his position. Maybe they thought that. Maybe they thought that if they preached Christ, the Romans would take all their wrath and fury out on Paul, who's a prisoner. We don't know exactly, but we do know that they wanted to call cause the Apostle Paul distress. So here is where you kind of think the next verse might be Paul complaining a little bit about that you know they're trying to cause me distress and they're just such bad people and I can't believe them and who do they think they are that kind of stuff what most of us would do but Paul didn't do that 
He says they're thinking to cause me distress. You get that? That's what they're thinking. Paul, Paul's like, yeah, they're, they're not, that's not going to happen to me. They're thinking it, but it ain't going to happen. Why? He says, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. You see, he didn't mind what happened to him as long as nothing happened to the gospel. Do you get that? He didn't mind what happened to him as long as nothing, as long as nothing happened to the gospel. Paul, as long as these guys are preaching Christ, he didn't care what their motive is. He didn't care if he, they're trying to cause him distress. It's like Paul is the apex of saying, I'm not going to take it personal. He, all he cared about was the gospel. And Paul had joy in spite, but he had joy in spite of the, the hardships because of his outlook on life. He just wanted to serve God. He had joy in spite of haters because of the outcome. Even these haters, as long as Christ is furthered, as long as God is being proclaimed, he didn't care about haters. He always saw that as, hey, how God can use that. God's using those people. They're haters. I don't care. What then? Verse 18, only that in every way, whether in pretense or or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So he just rejoiced in the fact that the gospel was preached. And, and again, let me just close with this thought. One of the reasons why we have, many Christians do not experience joy is because we don't value the right thing. See, the Apostle Paul, he knew the eternal value of the gospel. Guys, if you have the gospel in you, if you've heard the gospel and you own the gospel and you can tell the gospel, you have the most valuable thing on the planet Earth right now. So Paul understood that. He understood how important the gospel is. He said in Romans 1, 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it, it, is. it is. Nothing else. There's nothing else. It is the power of God to bring salvation to everyone who believes. God, you can't say that about anything else. You, you can't say that anything else has power to bring salvation except the gospel. See, and one of the, one of the big problems with Christianity today is we don't value the right things. Matter of fact, while I was doing this message, I had to repent. I had to weep and repent for caring too deeply about the wrong things. I mean, why do I care about so many different things? When I have the gospel. Why do I care about that? Why do I care about so many different things when I have the good news and I can tell that to somebody and their soul can be saved and they can live for eternity? See, that's what Paul understood. And I hope and pray that the Christians here in this church will start understanding that. And stop caring about things so deeply that really we shouldn't be caring about at all. Paul, he didn't care whether people liked him. Who care? I don't care if you don't like me or not. I've got the. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to purposely try to do something to make you mad at me. I'm not going to do that. I'm certainly not going to be mean to you but I'm going to preach the gospel 
I'm going to live for God. If you don't like me, that's on you. It's not, I'm not going to lose any joy over that. And Paul, that's what he, he, people hated his guts. They wanted to kill him. He says, I'm going to rejoice. And I will rejoice. He couldn't raise his hand up because he had a chain from the soldier. He said, I'm going to rejoice. I don't care if people hate me. You know, and we care about living in a house. Every once in a while I bring this up. I mean, I don't want to be homeless or anything, but I just don't think that's the worst thing in the world to happen to a person. I mean, if you're a drug addict and a drunk and you can't hold a job and you become homeless, that's a problem. But we value, we, we, we get upset because we can't live in a, in a nice house with air conditioning and a two-car garage and car packed full of all kinds of stuff. Somebody said there's three phases to life. The early part where you're, what is it? What is it? You want stuff. The second part is you, you get the stuff. And the third part is you try to get rid of it. Why do we, we, we even want it in the first place? We value things that really, we, we, we value things too importantly that really aren't right to value at all. And that's why we lose our joy. That's why we lose it. Because if you're a child of God and you're saved, bam, that's all you need. And I think I'm going to spend the rest of my life and the rest of my ministry trying to convince people of that fact. That if you're saved, that's all you need. So don't come complaining to me that you don't have a job where you're making forty or fifty or sixty or a hundred thousand dollars. I don't care. And don't come complaining to me. Oh, somebody's mad at me. They hurt my feelings. I mean, I do care about that, but I don't want people to hurt your feelings. But if you're saved, if you're saved, if you're a child of God and you have the gospel, let's be joyful about that let's be joyful would you pray with me Father we just want to thank you for the great gift of salvation through faith in your dear son Jesus Christ the fact that he died on the cross for our sins the fact that you came to seek and to save the lost We thank you for that, God. And Father, there's many of us, most of the people in this room have experienced salvation. They're born again. They have new life in Christ. They understand everything that I just said today. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us examine our life. We don't want to live our life shaming you by not having joy. I don't want people to look at my life and say, oh, Ron, he's saved, but my goodness, he's sad all the time. I want people to look at me and realize that you have brought great joy into my life through salvation. And that although things might not be perfect and wonderful here in this life, I have a hope. I have a blessed hope. That, that hope causes nothing to be able to take my joy away. And I pray, Father, that you would help all of us understand that, appreciate that, and stop valuing things too deeply that really shouldn't really get a whole lot of our attention. And Father, we just, and I do pray, Lord, if, <clears throat> if there's somebody here today that's never trusted Jesus and and they honestly don't have that joy in their life. They don't even know what I'm talking about. I pray, God, that you would touch their heart right now, that you would be gracious to them. And open up their heart, open up their spiritual eyes so they can see the truth. That Jesus is the only way. He's the only way to heaven. He's the only way to eternal life. And that they turn to him and accept him he will be there with his arms wide open ready to accept them in Jesus name we pray
Amen.